Thank you. Good evening, Glasgow. I come here from uh, Pennsylvania, which uh, has the distinction of uh, being the home for perhaps the most famous rodent in the world. His name is Punxsutawney Phil. Anybody heard of him? Yep. He's the groundhog that um, predicts weather. In fact, we have uh, a Groundhog Day every year. That's on the 2nd of February. It was made famous by the movie of the same name. And tradition has it that he gets out of his den on that morning. And if he sees his shadow, then we have six more weeks of winter. And if he fails to see his shadow, then that means he has predicted an early spring. So in Pennsylvania, this is a big deal. People come from all over Pennsylvania to Punxsutawney, lots of festivities that day. And the media make a big deal about uh, this whole Punxsutawney Phil Groundhog Day uh, affair. But lest you think this is how Pennsylvanians predict weather, you should know that uh, we also are the home for uh, many advanced centers of science and technology. And it hosts one of the largest weather forecasting companies in the world, AccuWeather, which came out of the university where I work from. A student 50 years ago started this company and now produces weather reports for all kinds of media, including media here. And I'm sure you've seen many TV reporters referring to AccuWeather forecasts and talking about computer models, predicting weather. And so my question to you today is, um, which one do you trust more? Punxsutawney Phil or the computer models? The answer is obvious, isn't it? But this is because we as a culture have come to um, appreciate technology and have come to adopt them in very big ways, in ways that have replaced uh, traditional ways of doing things. So take, for example, a simple uh, example of bank teller or what we now has ATM. I'm sure most of you, you have used ATM and most of you have given up going to bank tellers, right? Bank tellers are social, very nice, but ATMs are available all the time. They're accessible and we can go to them anytime and they are accurate, they are precise, and especially when it comes to your cash. They count your cash very carefully and they don't, don't judge you if you have to go back for more cash immediately, right, unlike tellers. And so we like many attributes of these machines. Machines have very positive stereotypes in our head, and so we invite them to our homes. Um, like, uh, for example, Alexa, Amazon Alexa. How many of you have Alexa? A fair number, a few of you. These are smart speakers that are being adopted in a big way in many parts of the world. And in my household, this is the voice of God. So whenever we have an argument about who's the star in a particular movie, we ask Alexa and she settles the debate or how many calories there are in a glass of milk. Again, we turn to Alexa. So one of the things that happens in my household is my wife complains to me every now and then that I don't help her with the dishes, with the dish, loading the dishwasher. So this happens uh, you know, once in three, four days. And I try to tell her, look, when she's out at work during the day, I do other things like uh, take out the dishes, but she never listens to me. So a couple of weeks ago, I turned to Alexa. When, she was, when, when my wife was complaining on her usual rant, I turned to Alexa and I asked. Who does the most work around the house? <laughs> I have been keeping tabs on what everyone in this household is up to, and I can say confidently that the person who does the most work around here is Sean. So the matter is settled, right? This is how it was. Even though my wife, who is an IT professional, knew that I went in and programmed Alexa to say that, it, it had that voice of authority. And that's what machines bring. It kind of immediately makes it look like the final say on matters. And this is something that we've now come to accept. Uh, just a couple of days ago at the CHI conference right here in Glasgow, I presented a paper from my lab group where we showed that uh, people trust 
uh, human machine agents much more than they trust human agents, especially with their credit card information when they're booking for travel and things like that. And likewise, a lot of you trust Google to give you the most accurate search results, right? Most of you just go to the top search result that Google gives you because we have that inherent trust in these Earth search engines. Or you watch the movies that Netflix recommends for you because Netflix knows what other movies you've watched. So you have these, you know, this inherent trust in these machines. And this is something that uh, I discovered some 25 years ago uh, when I found that people uh, thought that the quality of news stories was much better when uh, a computer selected those stories compared to when they thought the news editor selected those stories, even though they all read the exact same stories in the um, uh, same format and so forth. And so we have come to a stage where we are allowing news to come to us. It used to be we would go to news, we would uh, look up the newspaper or wait for evening news on television, or radio, but now news is pushed to us instead of us going and pulling news. So this is, this is what we would call personalization, where the media content is kind of tailored to us by machines. And in order for the media to be tailoring things to us, right, they need to follow us, they need to track us, they need to know where we click, who we talk to, right? So do we see a problem there? I see some heads nodding, right? It's, it media, machines can pry, right? They do, they can pry, and they do pry. And so some users are not very happy about it, especially those that are technologically savvy. We call them power users. They prefer to customize the media themselves. They prefer to go in and adjust the settings so that they can uh, get the experience that they want. They, ta they want to tailor the media rather than let the media do it for them. So in our studies, we see that power users prefer customization, whereas non-power users prefer personalization. And why is that? This is because power users know that machines are manipulable. They can be manipulated. They know that uh, you know, other human beings can prey on our trust in machines and then can manipulate them or hack them. So machines can be hacked, right? And the fine example of this uh, is the fake news phenomenon. You can see that lots of people created false information, false news stories in media, and then they deployed bots in large numbers to go out and uh, spread those stories, right? So these stories, spread like wildfire with great velocity because the bots would just target people with lots of followers and people with lots of followers, their followers would see this and say, oh, so many people have forwarded the story, so I should forward them more. So this happened even during the Brexit referendum. It happened during the US presidential elections. And this was uh, the reason why the fake news epidemics became such a big deal. So people can manipulate machines. And so some people want to take control of it. But it is impossible for us to tackle this phenomenon just at the human level, right? For us to tackle fake news epidemic, we need to be able to actually vet every story that's created every minute of every day, and there are thousands of stories literally, and even a vast army of journalists would not be able to help us uh, vet those stories in time before it becomes viral on the internet, right? So that's why some of us are advocating and um, investing in machine-based solutions to solve this problem. So we are trying to come up with online systems that can help us detect fake news, flag fake news, by you know, using human-based rules. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of rules that human beings know about how journalism works especially characteristics of language, the characteristics of uh, how a news story is structured, whether it circulates in a particular network as opposed to mainstream media, and um, you know, who the sources are. So we are designing a system which kind of takes all of those into account and be able to kind of automatically flag real versus fake stories. And this is an example of a collaboration between machines and humans because these machines are using human-made rules. And we have to be careful here about not allowing these kinds of systems to be misused by certain humans who might want to label some things that are inconvenient to them as fake.
right? So there's, there's every reason for us to be skeptical about these online systems, and that's what I want all of you to be, because, you know, you've seen these kinds of things happen over and over again. This happens even in the non-media realm, where recently we had two big airline tragedies, the one last fall in... Um, uh, Indonesia, Lion Air crash, and then this march in uh, Ethiopia, and both of them were because online systems malfunction, and because pilots were not trained to intervene in time, the air, aircraft manufacturer and the airlines thought it unnecessary to train pilots because the online systems would take care of it. Right? So the nose diving that happened with these aircrafts was because of a malfunctioning online system. There was not enough human intervention, and that resulted, unfortunately, in the deaths of over 300 passengers. And now the call is for better training of pilots and more collaboration between machines and humans. That's really the upshot of uh, the strategy and all the developments that are taking place with regard to artificial intelligence, where the emphasis is on designing machines that can leverage the strengths of both machines and humans, where machine autonomy is balanced with the human need for control. And going forward, those are the kinds of machines that we will trust and, in fact, that deserve our trust. Thank you.